Am I on? Oh, yes, I am. Good morning, everyone. Oh. Okay. Oh, this is wobbly, but it'll work. It'll work. So, very blessed to be here this morning to have the opportunity to to share. Uh, anytime someone asks me to share or Johnny asks me to share, I always say yes because I just know that God's just going to meet us. And, and most of the time, I know how one of his favorite expressions is how God uses ministry to, as an excuse to get close to us. And it really, it really is true as we get into, as we know we have to present. <laughs> We're more diligent, or at least I'm more diligent to go deeper in his word and and have that word to kind of marinate uh, within my soul. And hopefully this morning, that as we invite God to meet us here, that our hearts will be open to receive what he has for us. All right, so hopefully I won't put you to sleep. Hopefully this will be something that will be encouraging and, and a blessing. So why don't we go ahead and pray? Perfect timing. <laughs> yes. Oh wait. We'll, we'll just look at each other awkwardly for a moment. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord, we, with thanksgiving and praise. We thank you so much that we know you, and more importantly, that you know us, that our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And Lord, as your people, we celebrate uh, who you are and what you continue to do in our lives. And we ask, Father, that by your grace and through your Holy Spirit that you would truly meet us here this morning, that you would gather us together, Lord, and that you would minister to our hearts, you would comfort us, you would convict us, you would continue that good work that you've started in us. We pray for Johnny, Lord. I think he's, is he in Hawaii? <laughs> he's suffering in Hawaii right now. We pray that you bless him, Lord, him and Roxanne and that you would minister and refresh him. And just go before us today. Thank you so much again, Lord. Uh, what you don't want me to share, I pray you wipe those things from my mind and add new things that you want to bring up this morning. We invite you again here. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so here's our objective today. This is a little bit of a challenge for me because I really love to teach narratives. And I, I love to teach the New Testament, you know, about Jesus. It's so much easier to me. I enjoy it a lot more. Um, but we're not doing that today. We're actually, <laughs> we're actually going to be, our main text is going to be Psalm 51. And looking at Psalm 51, we really have to visit or look, review a little bit about what led up to Psalm 51. And so I'm going to kind of give you a snapshot of, of 2 Samuel uh, chapter 12, 11 and 12 to kind of just give you a little background. I'm not going to spend too much time there just to give us a reminder of what transpired, transpired before Psalm 51. And then when we're looking at Psalm 51, it's important that we view it in a sense of how, do, how does God's character reveal? Because anytime we read scripture, sometimes we, we're kind of self-centered and we always think, well, how, what is this saying to me? Now, there is an aspect of that. There is an aspect of God re, you know, convicting us, uh, comforting us, showing us areas in our lives, shining that light. But really, scripture, the first thing we should do is look, Lord, what is this saying about you? And I think we're going to see that in Psalm 51. And when we're saying reveal about him, but really about Jesus, because Jesus said what? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So we're going to see that. Hopefully that makes sense. As oh, God will bring it all together, and I'll be uh, a blessing to you. In Psalm 119, I'm going to read this for you. It's widely considered that David wrote Psalm 119. Oh, I forgot the title. That might make more sense. The title is The Heart of the Matter. So that's the title for this morning. So hopefully you can see where we're going. So it's widely believed that Psalm 119 uh, was written by David. And it says in verse 9 through 11, it says, How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander, wander <laughs> from your commandments. I have stored up your word 
in my heart that I might not sin against you. So that's an example of what a clean heart is, seeking God, storing God's word in our hearts. And then we're going to look at an example of the opposite of that, and we'll do that through 2 Samuel verse 11. So I'm just going to just give you, you can write it down, and I encourage you, if you've never have really read about David's sin with Bathsheba, then I encourage you to read that, 2 Samuel chapter 11. I'm just going to kind of give you the, the flyover view. Um, and says so in the first three verses, it's kind of the same old, same old with David. It's his soldiers, his men, he's king of Israel, his soldiers are out fighting a battle, but David wasn't. But he didn't realize he was actually in a spiritual battle because his heart was dulled. It was same old, same old. It says he rose up like from where he was sitting. So there's this comfort where he was at. And so oftentimes as believers, we can be guilty of that. In fact, if I just, when I, I'll, I'll test you a little bit. When I said David sin with Bathsheba, if you said, oh yeah, I've heard this a million times, that might be a sign that maybe your heart is a little dull this morning. But that's okay because God's going to deal with that in a, in a good way. Um, so the same old with David. We know that he inquired, like, who is this? He goes out and he sees Bathsheba bathing and he does the second look, right? He looks, oh, then he looks again. And so we know that, that he's filled with, with the, the lust and, and being filled with pride, thinking that he was, I guess, above that, that, it, that because he's king of Israel, that he was not susceptible to uh, falling to sin. But it's interesting because he inquires, and the person that his servant says, that's the wife of Uriah. But because David's heart was already full of pride, and, and he was dull towards the things of God, he was not seeking God at this time, he was not hiding God's word in his heart, he didn't heed that warning. That should have been enough for him to say, oh, Whoa, that's that's going that's going too far. That's gonna but no, what does he do? We know that he ends up calling for Bathsheba, and then David was put in a position of power by God. He was put there by God. And David used his position of power to take advantage of Bathsheba, to take advantage of the situation. Think about that. Let that settle in for a moment because David's the king and has this authority. He calls for Bathsheba and he commits adultery with her. But did she really feel, and the Bible just doesn't say this, but did she really, really feel like she could refuse him? Probably not. And I, I know many people have been hurt by leadership in the church. People have used their positions as a pastor or as a leader to hurt other people. And so here you have David. And I really want you to, like I said, we really have to look into this to get an appreciation of Psalm 51. To really feel and see how low David was. And how the slide, this, you know, it's called um, degradation, slide of degradation or something like that. It's like in Romans 1. It talks about how it gets worse and worse and worse. And so you see David, the initial look, the second look, now inquiring, he's warned because his heart is dull. He still proceeds to, to continue with his sin. And now David has to cover it up because it's discovered that, that she's pregnant. And this is going to look bad for a godly man, right? It's going to be a bad thing. So David then seeks to be like Adam and Eve. And he hides. He didn't, rather than confessing and coming to God and saying, Lord, I messed up. I'm sorry. Now I, I need to cover this up. And I need to cover it up in a royal, royally bad way. And so if you're familiar with the story, he uses deception. He calls for Uriah to come, from, her husband to come from the battlefield. And he encourages them, hey, you know what? You've been out there risking your life. You know, come and enjoy. You know, come and be with your wife. You know, obviously hoping that uh, David was hoping that then Uriah would think the baby was, was his and everything solved. Well, Uriah had too much integrity. He's like, I can't do this when I got my men are out there dying and 
they're not with their families. How could I do this? David still not, not getting the fact that God's <laughs> trying to, to convict him. He continues. It gets worse. Well, let me try to get him drunk the next night. So he tries to get Uriah drunk. Uriah still. So now, now David's in a pickle. <laughs> and he's, okay, so obviously Uriah hasn't been with his wife, so the questions are going to be asked. Well, how, what happened here? So then David says, oh, I know what I'll do. I'll take my pen. If they had pens back then or something. <laughs> and he wrote uh, for Uriah, when he goes back into battle, at the heat of the battle, when it's at its, like it's hottest, like when, you know, the swords are flying, the arrows are flying, step away from him. He ordered his men to step away from Uriah, knowing full well that Uriah would die. Let's have, I'm going to pause just for effect. Think about that. He went from a look, a second look, committing adultery, to conniving, deceiving, not a murder. This is low. This is who the Messiah, his line, David, was to be born. Jesus came through David's line. And just to really think how David, this is a dark cloud around him. He was no longer like Psalm 119. He was no longer with my whole heart seeking you, God. No longer doing that. His heart was the opposite of that. Um, but God, right? It doesn't end there. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, Ephesians 2, 4. And then I'll add a little ellipsis, dot, dot, dot. He sends Nathan to David. And that's so, that's so like our God. Because of his great love and his richness and mercy. It wasn't the end of the day. So he sends Nathan in 2 Samuel chapter 12. And Nathan, in verse, the first four verses, uses the example of a rich man and a poor man. Remember, where the poor man only had one lamb and the rich man had a whole flock of lambs. And the rich man steals the poor man's lamb, kills it, eats it. And then David response in verse 5 of, of 2 Samuel chapter 12 says, as the Lord lives. Ooh, so now he's bringing God into his sin. He's bringing God into his world of deception. And as soon as he says, as the Lord lives, this man shall die. And that's not what the Bible, what Exodus chapter 22 had, had declared. If, what the requirement was if someone stole you know, a livestock sold your lamb you were to repay fourfold you were to repay that person four lambs not be killed this rich man in this example didn't kill the poor man's son or didn't, the rich man didn't kill the poor man so David's decree was totally out of bounds I mean he didn't even say let him pay sevenfold it was no he should die and that's true with the heart that is distant from God. We find ourselves being critical, being judgmental, being unmerciful. And I'm, I find myself that way a lot when I'm driving because I drive like 80 miles a day when I'm working. And there's this like, I don't know, it's, just, it's hard sometimes. Like, Lord... Yeah, I'm listening to worship or something, and somebody just can't drive, and yeah, it irritates me. It's like, without, but that's a good heart check. You know, do it. But I know when I'm really in the spirit, right? When I'm really worshiping God, it doesn't even phase me. You may, you might experience that too. It's like, oh, I'll pray for that person. Oh, I'm good. Right? Uh, um, upset. And it's really interesting when when David said, I. It's really cool. When you look back at Psalm 119, if you look at verse 12, because remember how David said, as the Lord lives, and then he declares something that's totally not true. Uh, it says in verse 19, verse 12 to 13, Blessed are you, Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips, I declare all the rules of your mouth or all your just decrees. Did you catch that? So a right heart is declaring God's word truthfully and correctly. 
where David, he's going way beyond what God had de uh, declared. So, review before we get into Psalm 51. David's heart was full of pride. He lacked humility. Didn't see, didn't recognize the spiritual battle. Didn't yield. He wasn't sensitive to God. He wasn't sensitive to the warnings. Uh, seeking to hide rather than confess and repent. Overly critical and judgmental. And he lacked mercy. Among a lot of other things, but those were the ones I kind of thought of. So all those things. And then finally, in 2 Samuel 12, 7, it says, Nathan said to David, you are the man. You are the man. After David said, you shall surely die. And Nathan says, wait a minute, you're that man. And then Nathan proceeds to lay out all the consequences of David's sin. He talks about there's going to be war within your household. The sword shall never depart. We know his own son Absalom basically fought a civil war with David, tried to take over the kingdom from David. One of David's sons, Amnon, raped his half-sister, and Absalom took revenge and killed Amnon. Uh, Nathan declared, you did this in secret, but God's going to do this publicly, openly. And then finally, we know that the child that David conceived with Bathsheba did die. See, the low of the low of the low. And so now we can turn to Psalm 51. All right. Let me turn to Psalm 51 too. Catch up here. So sin always has a price to pay. There's always a price. Especially when you deal with sexual sin. It has destroyed so many families, so many relationships. And like I said, there's just like a dark cloud. I remember a few years ago, I was talking to one of my, I call one of my kids, but I was discipling him, and, and he had fallen into uh, fornication with his girlfriend. And it was interesting to talk to him because I'm talking to him after the fact, after he repented, after he had, and he was just kind of said, oh, just like I just felt like, like truly, like I keep using that expression, a dark cloud. You just feel like there's darkness around you. You're just, you know, that's because light and fellowship, light and darkness have no fellowship. And so here's David experiencing this ugly ugliness. And then you go to Psalm, one, Psalm 51, verse 1. And it says, have mercy on me, O God. This is from the depths of David's soul. This is like, have mercy on me, O oh God. This is not a, oh yeah, forgive me. This is, Lord, have mercy on me. And I love this word mercy. And if you've if you ever heard me share a little bit, I love to break down words because I'm a word nerd. But this word mercy is interesting. The root word means to bend or stoop in kindness to an inferior. That's awesome. So when he's saying, have mercy on me, is asking God, he's asking God to bend, stoop down as one who's superior to one that's inferior. So already, what are we getting? We're getting that David has been humbled. So unlike before where he was full of pride, now there's humility. And he's asking God, please stoop down to, to me, lift me up essentially. Can you picture Jesus doing that? I know a lot of you, when you think of that, you can think of New Testament examples of Jesus lowering himself to people. So it really is a beautiful picture of God. And then, like I said, asking for mercy demonstrates humility. God is rich in mercy. We talked about that, Ephesians 2. Rich means more than enough. So even though David did all this sin, even though we've done all these sins, God says, I got more than enough mercy for you. More than enough, even on your ugliest, darkest, most shameful, sinful experiences, I got, I got you. I got more than enough mercy for you that covers you. It's not just a little bit, not just enough. Oh no, I got more than enough. But isn't that like God? Where David says in Psalm 23, what does he say? That my cup overflows. But he talks about that. God, God loves to give. He loves to give mercy, the scriptures say. You know, Jesus says, be merciful even as your Father in heaven is merciful. 
I'll be finishing with verse, verse 1. <laughs> Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. Steadfast is a faithful love. It's a persevering love. So interesting, David lacked mercy. He lacked love. So he's going to the source of mercy, the source of love. The one who, who's rich in love, the one who's rich in mercy, because David was poor and bankrupt in those areas. And it reveals God's character. And not only is God extremely merciful, but his love will never end. It says, Jeremiah 31, 3, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have drawn you with loving kindness. Romans 8, and that's the whole chapter is amazing, but Romans 8, 35, a little snippet there, is who shall separate from the love of Christ? The answer, no one, nothing. So God's character revealed through his steadfast love. Okay, let's finish verse 1. <laughs> it says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Oh my goodness, you guys know what blot out means? <laughs> let, me, let me get some water while you think about it. <laughs> When I use the expression blot out, or you read blot out, you probably, I asked Annika, I'm going to put her on the spot, she gets all embarrassed. I said, I told her the other day, Annika, what do you think of when you hear blot out? She goes, oh, like a, a painter or something? Is that what she said? An ink pen? Yeah. I'm old, so I think of the days when I was, and I still write, <laughs> when you're writing, and then... You make a mistake using ink, and then you get the old white out. Remember that, those days, and you have to, and it's all crusty around the, the cap, and they go, and they do this, and you dip it, and then, right, you try to blot out your mistake, but then you end up like messing up the lines, and at least if you're like me, it's just it's a it's a mess, right? Well, the blot out can mean blotting out in those, in that respect, in that regard, but it also can mean obliterate obliterate that you can't get more descriptive than that he's saying God obliterate my transgression not just cover it up totally obliterate it that's cool I love that what does transgression mean transgression means revolt or rebellion and that's ex it's not just a sin it's like a next level sin Right? Sin is like the example that we use with David and Bathsheba where he did that second look. Sin. He didn't willfully go out there with the intent of looking at her. He stumbled upon that. It's like sin. We know we're probably familiar with the old English. It means to miss the mark, like an archery term. You're missing the mark. Where transgression is total rebellion. And that's where you see ha happening with David is he's holy in rebellion to God. I'm going to keep, not only I, I did this sin, but now I'm going to continue in this sin, totally transgress. And David says, obliterate that. Have mercy, O God, according to your steadfast love. Blot out my transgressions and cleanse me from my sin. I don't know, I think that's just so cool, the whole, the whole idea of obliterating and blotting out. Verse 2 says, wash me thoroughly. And it's interesting, thoroughly, it's like he didn't want any sin to be on him whatsoever. And sometimes we're not aware of our own sin. Like sometimes we're aware of when we sin, other times we're not. And David's saying, I don't want one, you know, renegade re sin on me that I don't know about, that I, that I didn't confess. He's like, wash me thoroughly. And it reminded me, a little bit about when uh, this kind of funny picture where, where Jesus is washing his disciples' feet. You remember that? And Peter's like, mm, no, 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 no. Don't wash my feet. And Jesus says, well, if I don't do this, then you have no part of me. Oh, well, then <laughs> wash all of me then, right? And so here's David. You know, says, wash me thoroughly. Get me clean. I don't want no more sin on me. Get me clean, Lord. And cleanse me from my sin. Verse 3. Oh, I forgot a verse, sorry. Uh, a reference verse. 1 John 1, seven says, uh, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from sin. 
And I forgot to mention that iniquity it speaks of perversion or depravity. So we're learning what transgression, sin, iniquity means. Verse 3, the cold verse 2. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. So now you have knowing is, is in this, what this means is I acknowledge my transgressions. I'm confessing it. I'm no longer hiding it. So moving from a cold, dark heart to a clean heart involves confession, involves repentance. And we'll, he'll go more, we'll go more into that as we proceed. But this acknowledging my transgression and my sin is ever before me. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So you, you have that confession. That's 1 John 1, 9, that confession. My sin is ever before me means it's continually before me. And there's no escape from sin, no matter how much we think we're getting away with it. There's no way we can hide it from God. All things will be revealed. And for the world, God sends us the Holy Spirit, right, for conviction. Sometimes we, they might call it a conscience, right? They kind of know right from wrong. But for a believer, we have the Holy Spirit living in us. And so that Holy, the Holy Spirit wants to conform us to the image of Christ. So not, not, not only as believers do we know right from wrong, do we know right from wrong even before we do it, but now we have a desire to please God. To be like Jesus. Is this something Jesus would do? Lord, help me be more like you. Help me to be loving like you on the road. Help me to, to be kind like you. Right? That's, that's a good sign for us this morning. If you're wondering, do you truly know God? Do you have a love for Jesus? Do you have a desire to know him more, to be like him? If you do, that's a pretty good sign. Right? Let's see, what else? Hopefully we're not boring everyone too much. Okay, Psalm 51, verse 4. This is, this is interesting. I, 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 this verse always kind of puzzled me a little bit. It says, verse 4, Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, uh, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. I used to think, well, it's kind of, what about the victims? What about Bathsheba and Uriah? It's not that David is, is kind of sweeping that under the rug and not acknowledging that. But it's really an understanding of how the law works. Right? So the law, God's law, had been given. David broke the law. God, being the righteous judge, will administer punishment. So the victim doesn't administer punishment. Right? If I was to go steal your car this morning, and you would expect the state, a higher authority, to prosecute me and throw me in prison, right? That's, that's what David is saying here, that ultimately all sin is against God because God is the lawgiver. So David, we know, he committed adultery, he broke that one. And he's lying, he committed that one. He committed murder, you know, he broke that one. He's, he did a bunch of them. So that's why he says that all sin is a violation of God's law. Sin is called lawlessness. In First John, it's called that. And then the Antichrist is called the man of lawlessness. Uh, and that's in 1 Thessalonians. So like I said, it's not up to the vic victim to render justice, but it's up to the higher authority. Okay. Let's look at verse 5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. This doesn't mean that the act of, of conception where David was conceived, that that was sinful. That's not what that's saying. Right? So it wasn't like his mom did something wrong and you know, that day was... No, what it's really speaking of is the sin nature. It's really speaking of that everyone that's born is already born as a, as a sinful person. In Romans 5, verse 17, it says, For if because of one man's trespass, speaking of Adam, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. And so you, you understand that through Adam's sin, that sin nature was passed down from, to everyone. 
And so that's why we see, you know, we don't teach anyone how to, how to lie. No parents teaching their little kid how to lie. We, it happens naturally, right? You see it happens naturally. Okay, so verse 6 says, Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. I love that. God's not into the exterior, the facade that we can put up with other people. He's not into that at all. He desires truth in the depths of our soul, and the most secret is heart. He wants to shine his light in there. It's, our, it's the word of God obviously plays an integral role in this. And we know, as it say in Hebrews, it says, For the word of God is living. This is Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 verse 13, and 13. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So, that secret place, God's word will reveal that to us. And so that's a good test this morning. As, as we allow the, as we're going through the word, and as you're hearing, oh, you know what, maybe I haven't been that merciful to that person, that family member, or that coworker. Maybe I've been judgmental of this or that, or, or I've been in sin. And God's just putting, like, I love that. I used to hear John Corson say that all the time, where it's like God's putting his, his fingerprint or his thumbprint right in your heart when you hear that. It's like God's word is revealing the intentions of our heart, the secret place. God desires truth in there. We can't lie to God. How are we going to lie to God? We can lie to each other all day long, but we can't lie to God. We can't hide from God. Okay, verse 7. This is so, this, this is really cool. And again, I, I love words and the meaning. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Do you guys know what hyssop is? Oh, good. Neither did I. And Annika did. She's all of that. <laughs> she told me, and then she told me where, where I could find it, and I didn't really listen because I'm, I'm not a good husband sometimes. And then, like, ten minutes later, I said the same thing she already told me. But anyways, it was kind of funny. So hyssop is a plant used for medicinal and religious purposes. Now, check this out. I want to see if, when I'm going through the next couple verses, if you can see the connection that hyssop has to Jesus. All right. <clears throat> So hyssop was used in cleansing from leprosy in Leviticus chapter 14. So it's used for cleansing leprosy. And even super cool, this is what Annika told me, but I didn't hear her. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 21 and 22, it says, Then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and select lambs for yourselves, according to your clans, and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. So that's the Passover. So they took the blood of the lamb with the hyssop and they used it, if you're familiar with that, if you're not, go ahead and read it in Exodus. But that was what they used when, when the Israelites were were imprisoned or in Israel, or not Israel, in Egypt, sorry, um, the blood of the lamb. So when the, when the angel came over, at the, if he saw the blood on the doorpost, then they would, that household would be spared. If they didn't have that, then they would be destroyed. Interesting, did you catch that? Jesus called what? The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So where David's saying, cleansing with hyssop, yeah, but he doesn't have the full cleaning of the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all sin. You catch? I just like that. I just love how when you can look at Old Testament and you, you, you can't escape Jesus. is all over the pages. And so when we, we allow the Holy Spirit to 
teach us his word and we just things just jump off the page and like oh that's so cool um, hopefully you thought that was cool like me Psalm 51 verse 8 oh for, yeah 51 verse 8 says let me hear joy and gladness let the bones that you have broken rejoice so blessed or happy is the one whose transgression is forgiven whose sin is covered Psalm 32 verse 1 there's a clean heart is a joyful heart. And that's a, another check for us too. Do we take joy in the things of God? You know, we, when we come to church, and, and when I say this, <laughs> it's coming right back at me. It's not like I'm up here I'm at all. I, it's honestly, when God reveals these things to me to share with you, it's because he's dealing with my heart. So when you come to church or... Is it kind of like, is there any joy in it? It's kind of like, eh. You know, I'm kind of, you're thinking about Denny's right now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying I blame you for that. It's just, where's our heart? Do we have joy in the things of God? Especially for, if you can remember, when you first became a Christian, right? You had that new Christian sprint. You were like telling everybody about Jesus. Right? You're going to hear, oh, I'm going to be in church on Monday, uh, Wednesday, Sunday. Tuesdays, you know, I'm going to be listening to, to K-Wave. You're like me listening to the Word all the time, telling everybody about Jesus. There's that joy, you know, telling everybody about, about Him. Because why? Because our transgression is forgiven. Of course there's joy. 59, 51 verse 9 says, Hide your face. This is awesome. This is a, this is a beautiful picture. Hide your face from my sins. And blot out all my iniquities. <clears throat> hide your face, not hide yourself. He's not saying, God, hide yourself from me. Because he's already asked God to have mercy on him. He's saying, Lord, don't look at my sin. Hide your face from me. Don't, don't look at that. And I remember when I was a new believer. Um, and I would do something really dumb. I would, I would really, I would think there would have to be a dis or a, a separation of time, if you will. There has to be a certain amount of time that would have to elapse before I could. Now I can hang out with Jesus again. You know, like I, I would mess up and sin. Oh Lord, I know I shouldn't have done that. And then I would be driving in my car or something, and I would a Christian song came on. I would change the radio station or. You know, the word would kind of, you know, somebody would be sharing the word. I would kind of, for whatever reason, I, I would do that because I felt like there had to be some time to go by. I just couldn't get right into it. I just couldn't get right back to where I was with him. But that's so foolish. And that's not under, understanding propitiation. Oh, that's a big word, right? You know, everyone here knows what propitiation is. <laughs> if you don't, it, this is what it means. Propitiation is how when Jesus went to the cross and when he died, that he was the, the sacrifice that God used. And we can understand one aspect of it pretty easily. Through one aspect of that, we receive forgiveness. But the other part where God had to really, really reveal that to me is you don't understand that Jesus was punished. That's the other side. Jesus has already been punished for my sin. God crushed his own son. So how can I, by distancing myself from God, punish myself Punishing myself to think that it's going to equate to the Holy Son of God's punishment? You see how dumb that is? I'm not calling you dumb. I'm saying my situation was dumb. To think that if, if I could just punish myself from, from experiencing more of God, that would somehow make up for <laughs> what His Son did. That's blasphemous. To think that in any manner or way, we can punish ourselves enough to earn God's mercy. God, that's a free gift. It's clear. He gave His Son. What more can, can we do? <laughs> Nothing. Just accept His free gift. Jesus already was punished for us. Which hopefully brings a whole new appreciation for what He did. You took my punishment. That cup that Jesus talked about was a cup of wrath. If possible, remove this cup from me. It was that wrath of being experiencing God's 
wrath for sin. He who knew no sin became sin, so that in him we might be the righteousness of God. Right? So, hide your face from my sin, O oh Lord. Don't hide from me. And he doesn't, right? God loves to give mercy. Verse 10. We're almost done. <laughs> Verse 10. Create in me, this is the whole part of kind of the, the conclusion, beginning conclusion to our message today. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. And renew a right spirit in me. David, remember, had been prideful. He'd been... Uh, let's just read it. I totally went blank. David had been prideful. He had been unmerciful, unloving. And now he's saying, Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. And we talked about a clean heart as, as a joyful heart. A clean heart confesses. A clean heart desires to want to be closer to Jesus. It's like that Psalm 119, a clean heart seeks God wholeheartedly. A clean God hides God's word in our hearts. A right spirit within me. That right spirit means steadfast. And steadfast means to be fixed, to be securely determined. To be fixed on what? To be fixed, well, I'll help you. <laughs> Hebrews 12.2 says, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. That's Hebrews 12.2. So creating me a clean heart, renew a steadfast spirit, a fixed spirit, a heart, Spirit within me, Lord, that I'm fixed on you, Jesus. That I, my focus, my my life's goal, ambition is you. That's when you know you're on the right track. That's when you know that your heart is clean before Him. Verse eleven: Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. So David was afraid that God's Holy Spirit would be removed from him. But we know that what? Jesus says, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. It says, <clears throat> Jesus said, remember, I'm with you always to the end of the age. That's Matthew uh, 28, verse 20. And then 1 Peter 5, 17, cast all your cares upon him for he cares for us. So there's not, not a sense of the Holy Spirit being removed from a believer. Okay, so let's Look at 14, 15, and then we'll finish with verse 17. Verse 14, 15 says, Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. A clean heart praises God. A clean heart loves to worship God. Worship, and this is really cool, Worship just isn't when like Don's up here leading us in worship. I mean, that's part of it. But worship is totally thinking of it like this. It's like you're turning your face to God, and it's like you're giving God a kiss. <laughs> Think of that's what worship should be. That's what our lives should be. And worship it can be used in response to God's grace, His goodness, and what He's doing in our life. But it also, if you will... It can be used to jumpstart an idling heart. So today, if you're feeling like, oh, I'm not really walking with the Lord, right? I mean, I'm just kind of, eh, I'm just kind of idling, I'm just kind of there. Worship. Go back to your first love. Worship. Start worshiping Him. Like, Lord, thank you for who you are. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for sending your Son. And you know what's going to happen? When you start doing that, God's going to start changing your desires. And you're going to suddenly be like, yeah, just love, love, in love with Jesus. Not just, like a, not just an emotional thing, but really a, he changes you that way. And it develops, you help develop a deeper relationship. Verse 16 and 17 says, 
For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, and a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. So if he won't despise that, what will he despise? He'll despise things that are done as a facade, as a, I'm just doing things as an outward show like the Pharisees would do. He'll despise that. It's despicable. That word despise means despicable to him. When we try to fool God and we try to uh, declare how righteous we are when inside where our hearts aren't right, that's despicable to him. And I never truly understood how certain people can go through life and pretend they're a believer. I don't get that. I don't get why somebody would want to act like a believer and not be one. Why? You're not fooling anyone. And God says he despises that. It's not into how much we give, how much time or money or what we do if it's not done in the right heart. He doesn't want it. Don't do it. He despises that. But what doesn't he despise? And we'll kind of finish with this. He says, the sacrifices are God, true sacrifices of God, are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. Broken, that can mean shattered. Contrite speaks of asking for mercy, confession. He won't despise that. When was the last time you or I were, were on our face before God crying over our sin? When was the last time that our heart was broken because we were not loving Jesus as we should? That's, God will not despise that gain on her face. He's a good God. And so I encourage you this morning, even now I'm going to pray. And if there's any area in that secret heart where you're holding back, where you're trying to hide from God, or maybe you messed up and, you, and you're thinking, I'm distant from God. Give you the opportunity to make your heart right before Him. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your word. How your word truly does reveal the intentions of our heart. How, Lord, how your light shines in the, our darkness how your light shines in the, the secret place, those areas in our lives where we, where we have sin. And I pray for those in here, Lord, that may be struggling with, uh, whether it be a sexual sin, whether it be sins of pride, whether it be sins of being unmerciful, or whether it's just putting on a show for others and not really having a heart that's broken and contrite before you. Please forgive us, O oh God. Please help us to be broken because of our sin. Help us, Father, to truly repent and confess those things before you, that you might create in us a clean heart, O oh God, that we might sing of your praise, that we might have joy, and we might truly worship you in spirit and in truth. And may you receive all the glory and all the praise, and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.